Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Small Steps for Better Health, our podcast series on easy and sustainable ways to improve your health this year. I'm joined today by Dr. Drew Blackstock because we are talking about avoiding or decreasing use of risky substances. We're on small step number 13. I'm Jeannie Alice Bruce. I work in the marketing department as a social media specialist. Dr. Blackstock, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for being here. Would you introduce yourself? Yeah, yes, uh, thank you for having me. My name is Drew Blackstock. I'm an addictionologist here at uh, North Mississippi Medical. Okay, so tell us what you do as an addictionologist. So um, we treat uh, various uh, substance use disorders ranging from alcohol use disorder to obviously the big hot one right now is opioid use disorder to stimulant okay. use disorders. And we use um, FDA approved uh, medications uh, to help treat those uh, and help improve abstinence rates um, by using medication. Okay, gotcha. So how long have you been here with the hospital system? Uh, a little over four years. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks again for being here. So, so far, all of our small steps have been what I would call, maybe not easy, but simple. <laughs> um, avoiding or decreasing use of risky substances is maybe not so simple. But let's first talk about what overuse of substances is. So how would you define that? So, I mean, any, any substance that you use to the point where it causes either mental or physical distress in your life or starts to cause interpersonal problems, mm -hmm. um, causing issues with family members and relationships, it's when that kind of becomes more of a, a pathological issue. Obviously, um, it's okay to have a drink here and there, but when it starts to affect your relationships or your work performance or it starts to affect your health and you can't stop um, because of that, um, then that's when we start to fall into the line of a, a pathology like addiction. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And so the most common substances that I think of when I think of <clears throat> overuse of substances, I think of obviously alcohol, any kind of drug use or non-prescription medicine and tobacco. So talk about um, how avoiding risky substances is important for long-term health. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, each substance is a, a little different. Obviously, mm -hmm. tobacco, any use is, is bad. Okay. And so you want to try and to uh, to just shoot for complete absence on that. Um, and depending on the individual, obviously, their, their recommendations for healthier drinking habits. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, drinking every day is, is frowned upon. Um, but again, if it becomes a issue where you're drinking beyond your control or you're drinking even though you want to, to mm -hmm. quit, that becomes more of a, a bigger issue. Um, and then again, any type of illicit substance that you're getting off the street, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I think Mississippi's gone with the motto, one pill can kill. Mm -hmm. So each each drug has its, um, its own issues as far as uh, danger. Um, you know, some take a little bit longer to kill you than others, right. but some can get you that very first time you use. So, you know, when it comes to illicit substances like opioids or uh, stimulants like methamphetamine, you want to try to avoid altogether and never even get started. But for those that right. have started, you know, with tobacco um, or alcohol where you can get them legally, uh, that, that makes it a little bit more tricky because they think, oh, I can buy it. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's not as big a deal. Right. But we know the risk of tobacco and we know the risk of chronic alcohol use and, and what, they, what they can do for, to people. So mm -hmm. um, really addressing them uh, as an individual and trying to get to the root cause of, of why they're using in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then again, helping with medications, whether they're, you know, anxious, depressed, treating those underlying conditions can really help too uh, in the process. So when it comes to alcohol, I know we said that there's, you know, certain, a certain time that you know it's time to quit or to work on drinking less, but is there a certain like number you would put on it, like a certain number of drinks per week, or is it more just when it starts affecting your life? I mean, you know, there are different types of, of drinkers. Some some drink to excess and can go weeks or months without drinking. And then mm -hmm. we're more, more binge drinkers. Right. Um, obviously, they, there's at risk drinking behavior, which for women is no more than one drink on any given at any given time. They do drink and mm -hmm. no more than seven drinks per week. Okay. Um, for men, that's usually one to two drinks at any given sitting and no more than 14 per week is anything beyond that is kind of risky behavior. Um, and then obviously anytime it affects your health, right? Whether you have liver issues mm. or pancreatic issues, and yet you continue to drink and it's going to worsen those problems. Um, obviously that's, that's another, another issue. Um, but you know, anytime that you have this idea in your head where you feel like, Hey, I feel like I need to get better control of this. Mm -hmm. I think that's when the best time to start is yes. not to, not to wait for it to spiral out of control. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. It's easier to clean up the mess before it hits the fan. So yes, so. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay, so, you know, talking about drugs and non-prescription medicine overuse, 
is a sort of a, t- a totally different conversation because we don't ever want to start using those drugs at all. And if we are, we want to quit completely. So we'll talk more about that in a bit, but let's focus on alcohol and tobacco for now. And, you know, quitting may seem daunting. It may seem very difficult, especially for people who've been doing it for a long time, but for people who are ready, it's possible. So can you talk about that a little bit about how people should approach that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think making set, making and setting goals, I think as human beings, we, we don't like to fail, right? right. So um, you are, it's very important to set a goal, you know, when you speak about tobacco, setting a quit date, right? Mm-hmm. And so making sure that you have that quit date set up to where when this day hits, all right, I'm gonna stop mm-hmm. uh, that day. And again, um, the average person is going to quit or try to quit. Uh, they're really trying to quit seven to ten times when it comes to tobacco before okay. they're successful. Uh, and so, you know, it, just because you've messed up or you've tried to quit and failed, well, it's not necessarily failure if you learn from the mistake you made the first time, right? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of patients um, that we see for tobacco that are trying to quit smoking they'll be able to quit during the day, but it's that first cigarette in the morning, they have a hard time giving up or when they're driving. Mm -hmm. And so we we try to come up with a plan for them to kind of keep their mind uh, uh, busy or do something else, whether it's have a pack of gum in the car Mm -hmm. uh, to help with that oral fixation or what we can do in the morning to help them avoid that morning cigarette or Mm -hmm. anti-craving medication to help with tobacco. So, you know, really utilizing all the tools we have, Mm -hmm. a lot of times people can be successful as long as they keep trying. That's Mm -hmm. the kicker is just keep trying. That's right. That's an important point that if you've tried to quit or tried to cut back and haven't been successful, that does not mean you're a failure. Try again. It's, yeah, it's worth yeah. it for your health. You'll never stop if you don't try. Right? That's right. And my dad, well, he was a smoker, but he he would always say, I quit smoking every every night, but I always just start back the next morning. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, as long as it's on your mind and you're trying to do better, that's the kicker. Right. And whether it's going from a pack a day to a half a pack and then over mm-hmm. time going from a half a pack to three or four cigarettes a day mm-hmm. and just working for, you know, less the less tobacco, the better. That's right. Progress. And I'm sure depending on who you are, there are different, you know, for some people, cold turkey might be the best option. Just put put the cigarettes down, put the alcohol down, Absolutely. never touch some it again. Absolutely, can do that. Absolutely. And then some people yeah. need to do a more stair-step approach and Correct. just try to, like you said, cut down to a half a pack for a while and see how it goes and right. then cut it down a little bit more. Absolutely. Anything, any, any less tobacco is always better. Yeah, there you go. So we can talk a little bit about setting SMART goals. And this is something that comes up a lot when we're talking about <clears throat> Improving healthy habits. So SMART goals stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time connected. So if you're if you're listening to this and you want to cut back on your tobacco use or on your alcohol use, you know, maybe setting a SMART goal is something that would help you. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I love the acronym just simply because this the specificity is important, you know, setting mm-hmm. a specific goal, mm-hmm. um, whether it be You know, right now I drink a six pack a day. Well, from here on out, I'm going to cut down to no more than three beers on Mm -hmm. any given day and set that goal for yourself. And again, making it attainable, right? If you've been a long time smoker at four packs a day, cold turkey may not be the best way to start, right? Because you don't want to get sucked into this idea that, well, I keep failing at it, keep failing at it, and then I'll just give up. That's right. right. Um, and so making sure you're specific about your goal and you're, you're hold yourself accountable. Uh, mm-hmm. Accountability is a big part of it. So being able to measure how well you're doing in that goal mm-hmm. and again, making it attainable and, and realistic is, is an important uh, part of that. But also setting a time constraint on it. Like, mm-hmm. you know, well, one day I'll quit. Well, yeah. you need a specific uh, a goal with a time connection to it so that you can hold yourself accountable. And I think that's a big part uh, of making it possible or being successful in achieving any, any goal for that mm-hmm. matter. Yeah, I really like what you said about, you know, if you right now are drinking a six pack a day and you say, okay, I'm going to cut it down to three, that that feels like something people could do and not fail at. And maybe they say, okay, I'm going to do that for three weeks. Right. And, and it's, then it's after a ball three, rolling downhill, right? That's right. right. And after so. the three weeks is up, you feel like a success. You feel like you have done what you said you were going to do. And now maybe you cut it down to two or one, or, you know, before you go to zero or one a week or whatever, whatever your goal is. Yeah. But that's, and that's good. There are some substances where you can't just, or a lot of, some people just can't quit cold turkey, right? Sure. So if you're a heavy alcoholic and you've had risk of uh, delirium tremens or, or DTs, mm-hmm. um, history of seizures or something, sometimes it can be dangerous just to, just to cold turkey. Sure. Right. And so, um, you need to, you know, talk with your provider or physician and make sure that you're doing it in a way that's safe for, for you to, uh, come off the alcohol yeah. simply because you're so dependent on it. Your body's expecting that GABA stimulation. Yeah. There you go. So that's a good place to ask, how does somebody know when they need professional help with substance use? 
Uh, you know, if, if you're trying to quit and you've been unsuccessful and you've s- tried to set these goals, but you can't hold yourself accountable and you continue to drink. And again, when you fall into that category of a use disorder, it becomes pathologic, right? Because you're, you're putting your family at risk, your mm-hmm. relationships at risk, your own health at risk. It's that, that time when we really start to talk about um, medications that can be used to help with anti-craving. And that's where uh, uh, people like me, uh, Dr. Boyette, come in to assist you in that, uh, that process, help you come up with goals. We help hold you accountable to those goals. Um, I always tell people, you know, I'm not here to be your dad. I don't have a guy complex. I'm here to hold you accountable. Yes. Right? Um, and so, you know, if you're doing well, we'll celebrate together. If you're not, tell me and we'll work on a, to find a way that we can help you achieve the goals that you're wanting. And, and different people have different goals, right? Some people come in wanting to be able to control their drinking. Some people come in that want complete abstinence, right? And yeah. so, um, you know, I've treated alcoholics, speaking on alcohol in the past, that some have come in and um, they were drinking to excess, but they want to be able to have a glass of wine mm-hmm. um, here or there with their out with their friends, but still want to be able to keep it in control. There are medications that we use to help with that. But some people can't do that, right? One, right. one glass of wine turns into a bottle. Yeah. One bottle turns into three. And so people are different in, in where they want to be um, and, their, and their success, I guess, when it comes to, to managing or controlling their drinking. Right. So you really take a personalized approach. Yeah, I mean, it's not a, it's not a cast a, it's not just a, a set, um, a set of guidelines that we apply to everybody. Right. I mean, you kind of have to one meet people where they're at. Right? right. My goal for the first week of their or treatment is going to be different for the guy drinking, you know, two fifths of vodka a day versus right. the person who comes in drinking three beers every day. We'll right. have different goals. Um, and you know, the social determinants of health come in a big play a big part in that too. Right. right. Um, some people. Um, have a lot going on in their lives. Uh, and so it's a little bit difficult. And so you really have to meet the individual where they're at. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So tell us more about the services. I know you've, you've touched on it, but tell us more about the services at North Mississippi <clears throat> Medical Center for Addiction. What is, you know, if a patient comes to you, what might that treatment look like? Uh, yeah. Uh, so um, we do offer medication assisted therapy for alcohol and opioid use disorder. There mm-hmm. are some really good medications for both of those. Obviously, Tobacco, um, we can help with tobacco cessation, but a lot of times primary care are already pretty good at that. Gotcha. Um, but with we have patients that uh, are trying to quit alcohol or opioids. A lot of times if you can approach them with the tobacco thing too, they're more successful at both than either one separate. So, gotcha. you know, trying to treat those things together. Um, but we use medications like naltrexone and acamprosate uh, for alcohol use disorder. Mm-hmm. And then uh, medications like suboxone or naltrexone uh, for uh, opioid use disorder as well. Um, as far as the stimulants go, it's a little bit trickier to treat stimulant abuse simply because there's no great FDA approved medication uh, for uh, stimulant use disorder. When it comes to drugs like methamphetamine, they just wreak havoc on the brain and we don't have a great mm-hmm. medication for that. So usually we try to treat the underlying um, mental health issues, whether it be anxiety, depression, um, insomnia issues, treat those underlying issues while still uh, holding them accountable, getting them involved with therapy mm-hmm. to work on some of the underlying trauma that usually is there as well. Do you see that mental health issues often play a role? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. I think um, mm-hmm. uh, mental health is a is a big problem in our country all the way around, right? And right. so, um, people that have gone through a lot in their lives or have underlying uh, traumas or depression or anxiety are more likely to seek comfort somewhere else right. if they're not getting it through relationships or in their life somewhere. For sure. They turn to a substance that makes them feel good. Yeah, right? that makes sense. Okay, anything else to add about substance use? Uh, well, yeah, I know that North Mississippi Medical has been great to me and done a really good job about trying to help the community know what kind of resources we have here. Mm-hmm. I think that's a, a big part of it. A lot of times people just don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the hardest part is just asking for help, right? And so yeah. uh, my partner, Dr. Boyette, and I, we really try to make it uh, uh, easy to access or to get access to treatment here. And North Mississippi Medical has been great uh, to work with us to help us do that, doing things like this so the right. community knows uh, what's available for them. And again, the hardest part is asking for help, right? right? And so that's the biggest thing is to help people understand that we're not here to judge. We're not here to point fingers or make you feel guilty. That's right. Because the guilt cycle in, in substance use disorder is not beneficial, right? right. And so. Um, if you need help, all you, all you got to do is ask. I tell my patients all the time, parachutes are great, but they only work if you pull the cord. That's right. Right. So um, we're here to be that parachute, but you got to pull the cord. That's right. So if somebody wanted to see you or Dr. Boyette or somebody at your clinic, how would they do that? 
So yeah, um, it's a uh, self referral. All you okay. have to do is call the clinic and uh, request an appointment. And we usually try to get the uh, substance use disorder patients in a lot sooner rather than later. Oh, good. Um, we have a thing referrals from the ER as well. But mm -hmm. you know, if you could, if you can avoid the ER, why wouldn't you? Right. Um, but yeah, you self referral. All you have to do is call and, and okay. make an appointment. So we'll make sure to put that clinic phone number in the podcast show notes so folks can easily access that if they need you. Um, well, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today to everybody who listened. Thank you to Dr. Blackstock for sharing your time and expertise. So another small step for better health will be rolling out in two weeks. Be sure to follow us on social media or sign up for our email newsletter that'll have more information and more education about these small steps. And just know that I know that avoiding risky substances barely fits into the category of small step. It can actually be a big step, but it's important for your health and I know you can do it and we have resources to help you if you need it. Thank you again for your time and I hope you have a great rest of your week.